such power until you stop and realize that every day somebody's going to put a piece of paper in front of you tells you what you're doing every 15 minutes. But um, when you've had coffee and all and dessert, and when we've had our little conversation here, why, I'm going to get a chance to individually greet each one of you in the next room, and we'll have some pictures taken while that's going on. So first of all, let me thank you all, not only for being here, but thank you all for what your presence means and what you have done in the past. There have been a few moments when I didn't feel like thanking anyone for my <laughs> being here. But somebody had suggested some prepared remarks for me, and I know that you've been briefed by several other people, and I'm sure that almost anything I'd pick out to talk about, uh, you already would have heard, like that for the last 12 months, the inflation rate has only been running at 2.6 percent. And uh, I have told some people before, and I'll tell you that I know that our plan is working because back when things looked so dark, our critics and opponents named it Reaganomics. And now that it's working, they don't call it that anymore. <laughs> But a great many of you are why it's working. If there's one thing I'm proud of above all others, it is what happened when we set out to have a task force, as we once did in California, on the private initiative and what the private sector could do. And we have a computer filled now with more than 3,000 programs all over the United States in which people at the community level or business groups you name it, private citizens have found ways to treat with some of the problems that confront us, uh, just as we used to do once upon a time before government thought that was its main mission. And uh, it has just, it's been thrilling and exciting to see what's going on and how much is being solved by the citizens of this country who've stepped in. But I'm not going to go on because I said I'll be, if I talk, I'll be saying some of the same things you said, but I thought, and while you're having your coffee and your dessert, that uh, there must have been some times when you've said to yourself, boy, if I had a chance to ask him. <laughs> well, that's how we can have a, <laughs> that's how we can have a dialogue. So ask me, let's have a little Q&A. Yes. Are you still determined to veto the repeal of withholding the interest in dividends? I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to tell you that I can't answer that right now because I don't know how it is going to be sandwiched and what they're going to send up. It, I can tell you they have waited down to the very last minute. And this is why someday uh, I wish that a president of the United States could have what we had in California and so many states have, the right of line item veto. Here in Washington, you have to take the whole package or veto the whole package and they can really put it in with some things that there's no way you can veto. So I'm waiting to see what's going to come to my desk. That's right. We, are, we have communist aggression in the American <coughs> and I support you, sir, 100 percent for taking a stand. And I think the American people will Thank you very much. Thank you. Bless you and thank you. Thank you all. The, this is probably one of the least, most least understood things uh, that we have out there on the airwaves and in the print, printed press, press and so forth. And we tried and tried to make the people understand not only the proximity, but what is actually going on down there. A very simple situation is this. Over, what, a century or more, we have seen Latin American revolutions, and they've always been simply exchanging one set of rulers for another set of rulers. 
But in El Salvador, we've had a situation where they are attempting real democracy. This is an elected government. And when they went to the polls for that election last year, more than 80% of the voters turned out. And the stories of those people, congressional delegation of ours went down as observers to make sure these were legitimate elections. First of all, the guerrillas had destroyed hundreds of buses and trucks, bombed them and set them on fire so that the people couldn't get to the polls. But they went, trudging for hours and hours through the hot sun to get there. They brought back stories, these congressmen, of a woman in the line waiting to vote. They had to wait as much as eight and nine. Can you imagine Americans? Only about half of us vote, and you can vote within about three minutes after you get there. They stood in line as long as eight and 10 hours waiting for the opportunity to vote. This one woman was wounded by rifle fire because the guerrillas had a slogan, vote today and die tonight. And she would not leave the line for medical treatment until she had voted. Another grandmother, she and her family threatened with death. She says, you can kill me, you can kill our family, you can kill our friend, you can't kill us all. And when the press would go by, the congressman told me that these people standing in line would turn and chant to the press, tell the truth. So this is what it is that we're trying to keep going with their, their reforms. They haven't made it 100%. There are violations of human rights by our standards, but for 100 years they haven't known what human rights are. They're trying. They're working hard at it. The guerrillas, on the other hand, are trained in Cuba, and even many of them were trained by the PLO uh, in the Middle East. Uh, there are, we have 55 military advisors, not advisors, military trainers. These are mainly enlisted men who are there trying to train the Salvadoran army, which had never been anything but a gar garrison army, so they can deal with these expertly armed and trained guerrillas. And in Nicaragua right now, Nicaragua is supplying the arms and weapons by way of the Soviet, or the Soviet Union and Cuba is supplying them by way of Nicaragua to El Salvador. They have thousands, literally thousands, of military personnel from Cuba and from some other countries there in, in Nicaragua. And yet the big fuss is being raised because we have 55 mainly enlisted men trying to teach the Salvadorans uh, how to have a military. And as you said, it's closer from Miami, is closer to El Salvador than Miami is to Washington. This is our backyard. And our dream is, and this is why we've appointed a commission. I made a trip down there to Central and to South America. I met with the heads of state. I know we've gone there with plans before, uh, good neighbor policies and so forth. But we never really did anything about them. And the worst thing is, we went as the big colossus of the North and said, here's our plan for how you must all uh, better yourselves. Well, we went down this time and said to them, you tell us, what are your ideas? How can we bring all these countries in these two continents, North and South America, together as equal allies here in the Western Hemisphere? We worship the same God from pole to pole. When we cross the borders into another country here, we're still among Americans because we're Americans in all of these two continents. Same heritage. And they were enthusiastic about this. And this is what our commission on Central America is supposed to do. Find a long-range plan by which we can end this, these lands of an oligarchy of wealth and the rest of the people in poverty, where we can bring them up to where they can have an e econ economy similar, similar to ours, where they can be self-sustaining, where there's opportunity for their people. But you can't do that while someone is shooting their heads off. They've got a land reform pl plan. Thousands of people in El Salvador have been given land that never were allowed to own it before. They can't go out and work the land because the guerrillas will kill them if they try. And so we think that it's proper to help them economically, socially, but at the same time to provide a shield and we're not going to have American people down there as we did in Vietnam. As a matter of fact, President Managua was just here and he openly stated, he says, I don't want that kind of help. We can do the job ourselves if you will see that we're provided with the wherewithal, with the weapons and the ammunition and so forth to do it. So that's what we're going to do. And there isn't, there isn't any similarity between what we're doing and Nicaragua. 
And maybe when they're so busy criticizing that, they might look back and see that the first armed forces that were sent into Nicaragua were sent by Democratic administrations. Uh, and it was a Republican administration that finally got us out of there. Uh, <laughs> I tell you that somebody else in this room for two and a half years has discovered the same thing that you have discovered. And uh, I couldn't have asked for anyone that has been more involved, more engaged in what we're doing, and worked harder than the Vice President has done. And I don't want to go any place without it. understand why I can't answer. You know, uh, you know there's, it's, a, it's a really a Hobson's choice. Uh, if a fellow said no, he'd be a helpless lame duck for the rest of his term here. And if a fellow said yes, everything you tried to do, they would oppose on the basis that it was campaigning. <laughs> uh, just well, lady and then you. Well, it'll be, it'll be my fourth trip uh, out there, and I, I have to tell you that having been governor of California, I came to Washington with the idea that really the future uh, lies in the Pacific Basin, and we are a Pacific state as well as a, uh, as a state that looks toward Europe, that I think uh, the old adage of go west, young man, still holds true, and uh, that is where the great new development is taking place. But you... Bob says we got to make it the last question. Right. Mr. President, would you comment on the so-called gender gap issue? The media seems to be trying to make a big point that you're losing your support among women. Well, it is true that the polls indicate that more women vote the other way than vote for me, but I figure that there's two gender gaps on account of more men vote for me than vote for the Democrats. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 but again, I think it's a case of not really understanding what we've done and what we're doing. First of all, in California, when I was governor there, we started in then and we found and changed 14 statutes that actually deliberately discriminated against women and we had all 14 of those laws canceled. When I came here, the first thing we did was set up an operation to communicate with the rest, with all the 50 governors, and tell them of our California experience, 
and every one of them appointed a representative within their state to start inspecting their own laws and regulations to do at their state level what we had done in California. But we didn't stop there. And to date, we are far ahead of virtually any previous administration that we know of, certainly than the one that just preceded us, with regard to what we have done. Our tax policy relieved to a great extent the marriage income tax penalty that was unfairly imposing on married couples. We almost doubled, went from 400 to 720, the tax credit for child care for working mothers. We did a number of other things in that regard tax-wise. For example, the changes in the inheritance tax that a spouse uh, does not have to pay inheritance tax. A number of things of that kind, but also from the civil court or the Supreme Court appointment to three members of the cabinet. Uh, this has never before happened in our country, but also a, more than a thousand appointments at a different level than, than cabinet of women in virtually every uh, facet of what uh, or activity that we have in the administration. And then I was, what happens and distorts this picture is that the other day uh, I saw on the news a comparison of the figures of the Carter administration with regard to women and ours, and it made him, gave him a little edge, except that they'd, no one said that they were using his figures for the total four years, and they were only using ours for the first two years. Now, at two years, if you compare what he had done at two years and ours, we're way ahead in every department, just as we are in the whole subject of civil rights. Here again, from the very first and beginning in California, we started down that path. And I will match our record against that of any administration that has ever served in this government. And yet, we're, we're getting no recognition. And now, one legal case that the Justice Department has brought has earned us the accolades of the press in that they're saying, well, now we're uh, doing it uh, just as a grandstand stunt. Uh, our legal cases with regard to housing violations, human rights violations, discrimination in education, top at this moment, those that are pending, those that have been completed, top anything, that, any figures that we've ever found in any previous administration. And uh, we're going to keep on in that direction too. But um, I guess I did more than answer a question, didn't I? I know I've got us late. I'm going in there. All right.